Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Robert Kaufman. I teach at the School of Public Policy, and I have the honor of introducing this event. Welcome, all of you, to the Augustus and Patricia Tagliaferri Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. Before introducing our special guest, Kay Cole James and Dean Peterson, I wish to acknowledge, and I want all of you to join in that, I wish to acknowledge and thank Gus and Patricia's daughter and son, Karen and Michael, for attending tonight. We greatly appreciate your parents making this evening possible. Tonight's Taglia Ferry lecturer is very special, Kay Cole James. I will mention only selected highlights of her long and extraordinary career, serving in the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, known as Bush 41 to some of us, in various capacities, director of the United States Office of Personnel Management for President George W. Bush, Bush 43 from 2001 to 2005, former president of the Heritage Foundation, co-chair of the Virginia Governor-elect Yunkin Transition Steering Committee, Secretary of State for a year during the Yunkin administration, K. Cole James is also the co-founder and chairman of the Gloucester Institute, which offers leadership training to African-American college students. She also works as a senior advisor to Governor Yunkin. K. Cole James has served on many prominent boards, and this is something I uh, noted. Um, she has done continuing board education work at the Harvard School of Business. I'd like to recommend you to Harvard at large because their administration can certainly use your guiding hand, to say the least. Kay has received an honorary degree from Pepperdine University's School of Public Policy in 2003. She and her husband, Charles James Sr., are the proud parents of three adult children and have five wonderful grandchildren. Our own Dean Pete Peterson, the Braun family chair, will engage Kay in a conversation focusing on a theme especially appropriate for the School of Public Policy, namely the interfaith, interface between faith and politics in general and how specifically Kay's faith helped her navigate the innumerable challenge that anyone of her stature will face in a political career. She and Dean Peterson will leave time at the end of their conversation for the audience to ask questions. So please welcome our guest of honor, Kay Cole James, and Dean Pete Peterson <laughs> for what promises to be an inspiring and informative conversation. Well, it is great to have you back. At well, it's Pepperdine. good to be back, yeah. and the campus has changed quite a bit since 2003. Right. We were just saying that even this facility was not even uh, opened at the time when you got right. your honorary degree here, yeah. so it is really great to have you back. And Michael and Karen, again, thank you so much for your family support and your friendship. And um, I know when we talked about the prospect of having Kay here, you were uh, not only amenable, but very excited about it. And uh, I know that tonight's gonna be a special conversation. Well, why don't we begin? The theme of this night is about faithful leadership. And I thought as a way of kind of framing the broader conversation, we'd start with the personal, but then broaden mm -hmm. out to where we are um, here in the United States in our political culture. First, let's just begin at the beginning, so to speak. Tell us a bit about your upbringing, where you started, and then uh, a little bit about how 
your faith in Christ began? When, when, when was that connection sure, made? Sure, sure. Well, I think I have a quintessentially American story. Um, it is no different probably than half the people here in this audience. And that is the uh, coming from humble beginnings and backgrounds. Uh, and if you didn't, your parents probably did and made it possible for you to be here today. Um, I actually had a welfare mom um, living in the public housing projects of Richmond, Virginia. And uh, growing up, I think, and coming out of that environment truly did help shape uh, public policy uh, much later in my life, mm. coming from welfare and then having the opportunity given to me by then Governor George Allen to actually shape welfare policy in Virginia was, mm. was incredible. Mm. But I can tell you that uh, coming out of that particular humble beginning and circumstance, being raised by a woman who was a woman of strong faith, uh, I think you would have to be to raise five boys and a girl <laughs> in public housing alone mm. um, and survive. And mm. not only did she survive, but she thrived. And um, I can tell you that coming from a group of five rough and tumble boys made Washington a rather easy lift for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was used to food fights uh, and used to uh, strong arms and tough conversations mm. and discussions. And you know, my faith journey is a real interesting one uh, because uh, I was sort of typical in our family, faith meant you go to church once a quarter, pay your dues so that you have a church that you can get married out of and buried out of. Mm. And so that's what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it wasn't a real strong element in, in the day-to-day -day lives of my aunt and uncle. I left living with my mother, went to live with an aunt and uncle when I was five years old. Uh, their faith uh, was uh, pretty much based on the model of four times a year to okay. pay the dues and mm -hmm. make sure you get buried properly. Uh, so it was a real interesting time when I turned the television on one night because back in those days you had TV dinners and you watched TV while you had dinner. And there was this gentleman on television and he was doing a crusade and it was Billy Graham. Mm. And Billy Graham was saying that, uh, that Christ had the opportunity to make you the person you wanted to be but felt powerless to become. Mm. Um, in Dr. Skinner's class today, we were studying the uh, 1960s, particularly the year 1968 and I was in high school at that time, and those were difficult years. Mm -hmm. And when I think about the stress that we had on us as high school students, dealing with the war in Vietnam, dealing with the assassinations, mm -hmm. dealing with the riots in the streets, uh, people who are concerned about where our country is today clearly don't know our history because we went through all of that. Mm -hmm and survived it, but all of those stresses I felt as a high school student. Mm. So I remember going back into my bedroom uh, after listening to him and saying, he said, if I turned over my life to Christ, he would give me the power to be the person I wanted to be but felt powerless to become. All right, I'll give it a try. And I figured I'd give him my life and if he didn't do too well with it, or if he screwed it up, I'd take it back, because why not? And uh, to show you what an obnoxious high schooler I was, I said, I'll give you a year, and I'll see what you can do with my life, God. And if I don't like it, you know, you can hit the road. And thank goodness our house had not just uh, old, but Old and New Testaments, and I found a New Testament because I said, if I'm going to give my life to this guy, Jesus, Christ, I thought Christ was his last name, <laughs> um, then, <laughs> then I would like to know something about him. Mm. Who is this 
guy? Who did he claim to be? Mm. What kind of claims does he make on my life? Mm. I didn't know anything about this person. Now I'm really going to date myself. I actually went to the library and went to the C's, because his last name was Christ, of course. in the card catalog, <laughs> <laughs> and said, I'm going to find some books about Christ. And thankfully, I said, oh yeah, that whole Bible thing. <laughs> The Bible is about this. I'll, I'll read that. And I thought it was the dumbest book I had ever read in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I got all the way through Matthew and it started repeating itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not even understand the concept of four Gospels. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I read this part already. Ready. Why are you telling me this again? <laughs> so that shows you how incredibly naive I was, how incredibly arrogant I was as a high schooler, but I think all of that fits. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I actually went off to college and met other students who were interested in learning about our faith and how our faith should impact our lives. But I went through that whole first year pretty much alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that was important for what was to come later. Hmm. I had to struggle with my faith. I had to figure out if it was real or not. And if it wasn't real, I was happy to discard it. I had to get used to going it alone. Mm. Because when I hit campus uh, in my freshman year, in the 67, 68 school year, mm -hmm. the one that we talked about today, I walked right into the black power movement where Christianity was the white man's religion. Mm where Christianity was challenged. Mm. And so for me, I had to decide rather quickly, is this true? Is this accurate? Is this real? Mm. Because I had to pay a price to be a Christ follower. Mm. And so I had to figure that out in my freshman year of high school, of uh, college. college. And, uh, and, uh, so I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And that laid the foundation and the beginning of my growth. Thankfully, I found something called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and was involved in study and met scholars and individuals who could help me uh, grow in that area. But that became the foundation. Mm -hmm. So you graduate from college. One of the themes that we talk a lot about here at the policy school is that there's a calling to public service and we use the term calling a lot it's been a big mm -hmm. thing in my life and I think a big <clears> thing <throat> here but that wasn't your initial step coming out of there so talk a little bit about that that time going into the corporate world family life and then the, your first step into not necessarily the public sector, but at least the public square. Certainly. Well, you know, I grew up at a time where if you were an African-American female, you were going to be a teacher. Mm. That's what we all did. Mm. And so I was trained to go into uh, history, secondary education. But it was also a time when we were uh, in the throes of integrating many of our major corporations in America. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to get out of college as quickly as I could, I actually finished all my coursework in three years mm -hmm. uh, and then did student teaching. And so I finished in the middle of a school year and couldn't get a job teaching. Right. And a friend worked at uh, one of the Bell companies mm -hmm. and said, they're hiring managers there. Mm -hmm. You should think about you know, taking a job there, which I ended up doing. And uh, to show you again how incredibly naive I was, it was a time when corporations were attracting and growing uh, their diverse workforces. And they said, Kay, do you have any more friends that you think might be interested in jobs in corporate America? Hmm. And I said, I sure do, and took them three of my best white friends. <laughs> so they were not entirely happy with that. <laughs> A little bit surprised when they all showed up for interviews. But um, it was a difficult time hmm. even then. Um, I remember my first promotion, and, I, and people did not hide their racism. And uh, this woman walked past my desk and said, I guess you have to be colored to make it in this company these days. 
And you know, that's when I knew I was prepared for debates for later in life, because I didn't even look up. I said, no, you just have to be good. <laughs> um, and I, I, I used to encourage young African-American students going into corporate America that they would face those kinds of walls and those mm -hmm. kinds of uh, bigotry. You just have to be good. Yeah. And when you're excellent at what you do, they can't ignore that. Yeah. So it was a difficult time growing up and, and integrating the schools in the South, uh, being the first among those going into corporate America. Um, I really did earn my stripes back in those days. What I'm sensing in your life story is God taking you through things in the early parts of your life that come, keep coming back mm. and back and back again. Um, this piece about, I guess we would call breaking down walls or barriers, whether as a woman or a woman of color or as a Christian, I've heard you speak in other contexts about facing challenges in all those dimensions throughout your life. And, and until recently, and I wonder if you could, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your faith has grounded you when you have had to suffer those attacks mm -hmm. on things that have nothing to do with you in a sense, but, um, but you still have to see God's calling in the midst of suffering either treatment because of your race or because you're a woman? Well, it's even more complex than that. I said, there's a lot about me that you could hate if you wanted to. Not only black, not only female, but the audacity to be a conservative mm. and to be pro-life and to be a Republican. I mean, pick a category. I mean, <laughs> I, there's a lot there for a lot of people not to like. Mm. And I, I have felt all of that. Um, Charles and I, when I was uh, speaking out on college campuses, there, there, there were times when I had to be escorted off campus by campus police, uh, where we actually had security. Um, and I think if you are not comfortable in who you are, mm. if you are not uh, convinced of the calling that God has on your life, you must know that mm. in order to survive and to be sustained through some of the things that, that you will confront in life. Mm. Um, Sometimes I think we paint too rosy a picture uh, for young people in terms of, of, of what lies ahead. Mm. Uh, and we don't prepare them well enough uh, to go out and face that. But to be grounded in scripture, to be grounded in your faith, to know who you are. I mean, on the darkest days of discrimination, uh, and growing up in the South where I had to cross uh, police lines just to go to junior high school. Um, even, even in later years mm -hmm. when I experienced, um, and let me tell you, this comes as no shock, I'm sure, to anybody in the room, but you, 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 st <laughs> you still face a great deal of, of pushback, even as a woman, and particularly as a strong woman, mm. um, to know that you are the daughter of the king mm. goes a long way to help you get through the day. Mm. To know that, and, and, and to know that, you know, my faith has actually been, people ask me, how did you serve 40 years in and out of government and never been indicted. Um, <laughs> said, well, you know, when you are grounded in faith and you live by certain principles, those principles protect you. Mm. There are certain things you just don't do. And I would tell all of my students um, when I was uh, a professor of government that um, I would 
Never, ever, and I encourage each and every student in here who's going into government or public policy, never ever do anything that is either illegal, immoral, or unethical. Mm -hmm. And when you are based in that and hold to it, it protects you. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if the President of the United States, a cabinet officer, or chief of staff, or anyone asked me to do anything that was illegal, immoral, or unethical, I just wouldn't do it. And I'm telling you that's going to be your protection. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to fudge something, to, to backdate a document, to, to, to cover for your boss for some, just don't do it. And I have had to walk away from jobs because I refuse to. Mm -hmm. And um, in every single step of my career, whatever l momentary loss that was, was made up many times over mm -hmm. down the road. So I think that my faith protected me mm -hmm. in 40 years of public service. Mm -hmm. And I never got indicted. <laughs> <laughs> now, that transition from your time in the corporate world into the, not necessarily public sector, but first the kind of public square came through the pro-life movement. It did. And one of the things I also found fascinating about coming to learn about that transition for you is not only were you overcoming a number of different things around uh, that, that spring out of a very polarizing policy in, in the United States, but you overcame some personal things having to do with seeing yourself as more of an introvert, but oh. being moved into a place where, as a spokesperson and being someone out there, you know, in the public square, again, around a very fractious issue, I think about the many biblical characters who, <laughs> at different points, like Moses, for example, just says, you know, I'm, I'm not your guy, yes. right? Um, talk a little bit about what that was like and how you had a sense of God's calling into a place where it was very uncomfortable, it must have been very uncomfortable. It was extremely uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> the, Charles and I both were very concerned about the condition of the black family and recognizing the important role that family plays, we had made the decision that when we began to build a family, I would become a full-time stay-at-home mom. And I left corporate America, and we actually had the conversation about which one of us would make the better stay-at-home person, mm -hmm. and I won. <laughs> um, and um, I actually write about the fact that I did not have the confidence to read scripture at a women's Bible study out loud at our church because I was that hesitant to be in front of an audience. Mm. And uh, so I say to, to young people and, and especially women today, I accept no excuses uh, because when I first stepped out, uh, I got a phone call and I was asked to debate the abortion issue on national television. Mm with a representative from Planned Parenthood. And I am fond of saying the most controversial thing I had debated at, up to that point in time in my life was standing in front of the refrigerator going, chicken or hamburger? <laughs> Which should we have for dinner? It was, it was only that deep and only that complicated. So the thought of stepping out on such a controversial issue uh, but several things compelled me to do it. One was my family. Two, because I thought it was the greatest civil rights issue of our time, and if I were given the opportunity, I should speak out. Mm -hmm. uh, three, because I felt that preborn children didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, I felt I was a pro-life feminist. I really do mm -hmm. view myself as a feminist. Mm -hmm. uh, I refuse to give up that title. Um, and uh, so I got thrust into that. And the next thing you know, I was asked if I would do it full time. Mm. And I had no desire, 
no desire to do debates, and I mm. debate, debated at that time all over the world, um, mm. the life issue, and um, I, 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 I don't know how I did it. Wow. I really don't, uh, except I knew that I was called to do it. Yeah. And I showed up, and there was a lot of prayer, mm. and there was a lot of, God, give me the answer to this. And so I have had the opportunity to work with uh, many of our politicians uh, in terms of how to frame that issue, how to mm. talk about it. We do a very poor job of it, mm. very poor job of it. Mm. And uh, so, yes, I made that transition from corporate America when I got the phone call from the National Right to Life, would you leave your corporate job and come and be a full-time spokesperson for the National Right to Life? And I said, absolutely not, and hung the phone up. <laughs> and went home that night, and my kids actually were the ones who said, but mom, you said, if God ever gave you the opportunity mm -hmm. to stand up for mm -hmm. the greatest civil rights issue of our time, you would do it. And so they shamed me into <laughs> taking the job. And I quit my corporate job, took a huge pay cut, and went to work in the pro-life movement. How did your faith actually, you mentioned prayer as being an important part of your life. How, how did you sense it, especially during that time when you were going around the country, around the world, debating, you know, you're overcoming, obviously, some of these internal tensions about being out there and, uh, and at the same time, not only are you public speaking, you're actually in debates with others. How, how did that help shape your faith or how did your faith sustain you during that time? <laughs> well, you know, I'm studying Hebrews right now and one mm. of the things that really mm. jumped out at me was, is um, that God calls us to obedience. Mm. And I wish I could say I was a happy warrior. I was not. I went kicking and screaming at everything I ever did. Mm. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be there. But um, um, I knew that I had been called to be there. Mm. And um, uh, I, I can remember a particular debate at Princeton University um, and it was uh, one of the top pro-choice leaders in our country, and I was mortified. Mm. I was sick for three days leading up to that debate. Mm. And it was fascinating to me, um, when you make yourself present and available to be used, how God shows up. Mm. And I have seen that happen in my life over and over and over again. Mm. And I can tell you, he delivered the lines that I needed in the moment. Um, and I, I, many of the debates that I did were quite formal, mm. and they were scored. And, mm. they, and, and there were those individuals on campuses who had to give me the debate for although they hated my position, but they would say, well, yeah, you won you the won. debate. Um, and I can take no credit for it. I was a sniveling, scared, petrified, mortified, showing up person, wow. but trusting that God would provide, and he always did. When I left the Heritage Foundation, um, many said, so what's next for you? What are you gonna do next? And I said, I'm gonna go home, sit on the couch, and watch I Love Lucy reruns until God tells me what's next. <laughs> and it only took about a week and a half, so yeah. I didn't get very far. Yeah. yeah. So the transition then into government, um, one of the things we talk about in our degree program here is that we, we describe it as more of a cross-sector degree mm -hmm. that students upon graduation could go into the nonprofit world, they could go into the policy-related corporate world, uh, and obviously they could go into government. Um, you've had a cross-sector life. Um, talk a little bit about in going into the federal government. First, what that was like just from a cultural perspective, having been in the corporate world mm -hmm. and also working in the nonprofit world, but also just again, how your faith sustained you as you 
came into some significant leadership positions in the federal government? You know, uh, they are all very different worlds, and I taught a graduate level course one time on the different qualities of leadership that were needed for each of mm. those sectors. I'd love uh, to see that syllabus. Uh, yes, for the military, for government, for the nonprofit sector, uh, and uh, corporate. Uh, it, it, there are some similarities, but there are also quite a few differences mm. uh, in order to succeed in those different environments. But I think that anyone who is well-read, mm. knows how to analyze data and information, uh, loves solving problems. Um, I tell staff when I hire them, if you don't enjoy eating problems for breakfast, you probably don't want to work for me because <laughs> we embrace problems. Uh, we love them. Mm. Um, and so, um, I, I, and, and, a, and a huge work ethic. I would say to anybody in public policy, uh, one of the ways to succeed in that environment, whether you're in government or in a nonprofit or in a think tank, is you may not, everybody here is smart. That's the entry ticket. Mm. That's what gets you in the room. But that's not what's gonna make you succeed in that area. And what's gonna do it is a work ethic. Mm. And I tell young people as they're going into government and public policy that y you're gonna work harder than you've ever worked in your life. I am always the first person there in the morning and the last person to leave in the evening. Mm. And it's 24 seven. Mm. And if you're ever gonna come work for me, you have gotta be prepared to take the call on Saturday morning. I just thought of this, mm. this is a great idea. Can you flesh that out and let's talk about it when we get together on Monday. Um, but I have found that those skill sets will serve you well in any of those sectors mm -hmm. that you go in. Um, people always, always look to individuals who are talented, sharp, bright, but boy, do they value hard work. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think uh, is sort of the key to all of all those of various those. sectors. Now, how did faith play an impact um, in all of those. Um, again, I would say it is, it is an armor. It is, mm. it is what, what steals you to be able to survive in any of those environments. Mm. Uh, corporate America is as political as any political party I've ever <laughs> been in. Um, oh, and you talk about politics with a small P, mm. when I was in the academy uh, in a university setting, that's nothing but politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, learning how to navigate all of that mm. uh, and maintain your integrity and your character and your faith is so important. Mm. I want to broaden out um, to the broader cultural issues, the political cultural issues. But before I do, I had to dive down into one particular time in your career uh, because it is it's a pretty important day at Pepperdine here which is 9-11 uh -huh. um, straight mm -hmm. out across the parking lot there we have something called the Heroes Garden that commemorates the the life and death of Thomas Burnett who was on flight 93 we have an annual celebration called the waves of flags that uh, one flag for every person was killed on that day mm. um, you were there. Yes. And had to make some major decisions affecting tens if not hundreds of thousands of people. Take us through a little bit about of, of that day and how if your, your faith sustained you during just some overwhelming challenges and pressures. You know, that particular day, um all the rules went out the window. Mm. Uh, I have had to learn how to navigate public life with my private faith. Mm. Um, and how not to be obnoxious with one's faith in the public square. Mm. But when the plane went down in Pennsylvania mm. and I had gathered my senior staff in the office I asked if anyone objected if we could spend a few minutes in prayer. 
Mm. And I never would have done that mm. uh, on a normal day at work, I can assure you. But everybody, even the atheist, appreciated a moment of prayer <laughs> at that particular time. How many people were we talking about? Like, what was the? It was about 12, 14 people in yeah, the room direct at the time. Yeah. Direct reports, absolutely. Um, mm. And then after that, um, you know, realizing that people are all at different emotional uh, stages in their lives and different personal pressures. I wanted to give anyone who was in that room the freedom to leave, mm. to go check on family, to, to you know, get children out of daycare centers. But I also needed a core team to be able to continue to run our government. Mm. And I'll tell you, at that moment, I was shocked at who left and who stayed. <laughs> <laughs> you think you know yeah. who in the individuals are and, and, and you know, what kinds of decisions they would make in a circumstance like that. But um, the purpose of terrorism, quite frankly, is to terrorize. Mm. And all I knew in that moment was that uh, God was in control. Mm. Uh, my life and those of all around me were in his hands and that I had a job to do. Mm. And I didn't have time to be terrorized. Mm. And so we worked that day all the way up until 10 or 10.30 that night. Charles was on the other side of the country mm -hmm. um, and I had to go home to an empty house that night. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it is in moments like that when your faith really does matter. Do you believe God? And I remember mm -hmm. Charles having said to me in another circumstance, if you say you believe God, then act like it. What, what, does that, what does a person who says they believe God look like in that situation? Mm. So having to walk out your faith, and it was really interesting, I had a dog at that time uh, because I had led seminars on faith, I had uh, written articles about faith, I had done women's Bible studies on faith. I just didn't have any of it. <laughs> Never had to because when you're a type A personality, you can make it on your own mm. uh, with your own uh, skills resources. and resources yeah. and yeah. that sort of thing. But there are circumstances that come along in life where you just, you, and that was one of them. Yeah. Um, and so I heard Charles's voice in the back of my head saying, if you are a person of faith, and you are in charge of the entire federal workforce during 9-11, what would that person look like, act like, and do? Hmm. And so I just did that until I got home that night and was able to break down hmm. um, by myself in my house. Hmm. Um, but, uh, but being able to walk in your faith when it's real, hmm. And not, it's not academic. Right. You're in those situations where you really have to walk it out. Mm -hmm. And certainly 9-11 was one of them. It was one of the most terrifying days ever. I mean, my office, there were rumors going everywhere. And I looked right out my window, and they said there was a car bomb right at the State Department. Turned out there wasn't. But mm -hmm. um, we knew any minute we we could be gone. Mm. There were rumors of other planes that were headed to buildings in Washington and we were blocks away from the White House. Mm. Um, and I would say one of the things that I covet for each and every one of you is the opportunity to have your faith tested. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say mm. uh, because I know what that means. Mm. But when you come out the other side of it, when you walk, as, as a friend of mine who's a pastor says, when you walk through the miracle mm. and come out the other side, uh, you come out tempered and stronger mm. and, and ready for the next battle. Mm. That's so good. So we're having a conversation, but you are a great lecturer. 
<laughs> I mean, I listened and watched a dozen of your speeches in preparation for this. And uh, I almost feel ashamed that I'm interrupting you with questions <laughs> because you are a great speaker. The speech you gave, the commencement address at King's College a couple of years ago, was tough. Mm. In that speech, you spoke prophetically, as you often do. But in particular, in that speech, you spoke about your sense, and to quote your words, which is obviously quoting from a somewhat famous television series, the winter is coming. Mm. That what you're seeing in our political culture really gave you a sense of deep concern for the state of our public institutions, for the state of our politics. At one point in that speech, you said that you had a sense that the threads of democracy were unraveling, I think was your exact mm -hmm. phrase. And here we are, two and years here later. here we are. So what is, what is your sense of where we are now in our politics? And as people of faith, it feels like one of the exacerbating factors for the winter is coming period is that we had also, as with so many other parts of our country, appear to be on the edges. We're either over-engaged and over-focused on politics as the only way to realize whatever good future comes or whatever bad future can be avoided. Or we can take what is one author called the Benedict Option, which is to Stay away from politics. Politics is a dirty business. We don't really need to get involved in that. And that's just all temporal kind of stuff. And God's going to have his way anyway. So why even vote, some have said. Mm. How do we strike a balance? How do you see where we're at in this moment? And for people of faith, I, I don't even want to say encouragement because we are, there is, I share your sense of foreboding about where we're at. Uh, it's what gets me up in the morning, but at the same time, it's, you know, makes it difficult to go to sleep. Sure, sure. Um, what would be your, your thinking, your assessment of where we're at? Do you still have that sense of winter is coming? Okay. I do. Okay. Um, but it was a good reminder today in class as we studied 1968, mm. and it helps to be old. Mm because I was reminded of where our country was then mm. with the riots in the street, mm. with the Vietnam War protests, mm. with the, all of the assassinations and what we're going through. 1968 makes this look like a piece of cake, actually, mm. truth mm. be told. Mm. And there were those who thought we would never survive that as a country. Mm. Uh, it was interesting to me. I, I really felt like <clears throat> the unrest at that time uh, uh, was largely coming out of the left, and a lot of the unrest I see today is coming from the right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. It's all uh, uh, politics. How do we as Christians respond to all of that? I think. I think we walk out what it means to be God's people in a, in a hurting, crazy world. Mm. We walk out what it means to actually love someone that we vehemently disagree with. Mm. It means that we offer acts of kindness to our neighbors when the rest of the neighbors are feuding over yard signs. Mm. Um, and I think we demonstrate to the world what it looks like. We as Americans have to demonstrate to the world what it looks like to live in a pluralistic society. Or we have nothing that we can add on the international stage. How can we counsel the, uh, mm. uh, you know, the various factions that are at war uh, in you know, Israel and Hamas, or the Sunnis and the Shias, mm. we can't figure it out. Mm. 
And I think that we have a tremendous opportunity to model um, God's love in a hurting and dying and crazy world. Mm. And so I make it a point, and, and it really infuriates some of the people who are on my side of the aisle. <clears throat> I make it a point to reach out yeah. to people on the other side of the aisle and remind them that I'm trying to build bridges there. I'm trying to win them over, not mm. blow up bridges. Mm. How do you how do you how do you grow people, bring people to your side? Mm. And I I don't have a lot of patience for the anger, the vitriol, the the uh, the uh, the sort of hate-filled politics of today. Mm. <clears throat> and I don't say that pointing at any one side because I was the beneficiary of it from the left. Mm. Uh, long before, when people say, you know, Donald Trump brought this new day into American politics, and I'm going, where were you when I was getting running off, run off college campuses? Mm. Where were you when I was called hateful names? Where were you when the Democrat Party kicked me out because I was pro-life? I, I mean, I, I, I saw it from there. We, mm. This didn't start just mm. recently mm. Uh, with uh, politics today. This has been a simmering pot. Mm. But the good news is, having lived through the 60s, I know that this country will, can, and, and will survive. Mm. Uh, I have a great deal of, of faith in the documents that our founding fathers gave us mm. in terms of how to resolve conflict in this country. I have a great deal of trust in the checks and balances that are there. Mm. Uh, this country is bigger than any one person or personality. Uh, so I tend not to be discouraged. Mm. Um, but I just think we live in some interesting times that we will survive. So we're going to go to audience questions here in a couple minutes, and we're going to do those via question cards. So uh, those cards should be in your um, brochure uh, agenda for the event. And if you have questions, pass those down, write them down, and pass them down to Melissa, and we'll integrate those here in a couple minutes. As I said before, you've worked in breaking down a lot of barriers, and some of those barriers are still there. Indeed. In another interview I heard you give, you coined a phrase that I haven't heard before, but I think is, I think is uh, very provocative. And in the area of race, you said you're not so much about racial reconciliation mm. as you are about racial conciliation. Reconciliation understands that something was consiled that needs to be reconciled. And we haven't had that. That's right. We've had progress, but we haven't had, certainly we didn't, never started in a place of conciliation. And so, especially in the areas in which you have worked, and worked is not even sometimes, the, maybe not the right word here, the places where you to borrow from Paul in Acts, where you live and move and have your being. Mm. And by that I mean within evangelical circles, mm -hmm. within the conservative movement, there's still some racial conciliation that needs to happen. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and again to the degree how your faith sustains you in the midst of probably audiences that think that everything is okay? I'll tell you, um, learning the lessons of forgiveness will help you survive a lot in life. Mm. <laughs> um, probably one of the more difficult tasks for me as a conservative, and I have often had to say to conservative audiences, I defy you to challenge my conservative bona fides mm -hmm. um, in any area, whether it's foreign policy, economics, mm -hmm. domestic policy, you name it. So having said that, 
I would expect that you would allow me as an African American to be able to say that race is still an issue in America today. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing to me that there are individuals who want to deny that, which means that they are asking me to deny a very important part of who I am and what my life experience has been. Mm -hmm. This year, this year, I have grandchildren who've been called the N-word in school. Not 30 years ago, mm. this year. This year, I have a grandson who was called a monkey and lots of other racial disparities. I could go story after story in our own experience as adults, what Charles and I have experienced mm. in terms of race and racial discrimination. Mm. For me to acknowledge that racism is still a problem in our country today does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that I believe that America is a racist country because I don't. Those are individuals. But how can you ask me, who is a bona fide conservative, to deny my own existence and my own life experience? Mm. And I thought that I would not have to fight these battles for my grandchildren, mm. but I still do. I still do. And, um, and if I... Uh, I have to extend grace to people mm. in understanding their background and how they grew up and why it's difficult for them to admit that race is an issue in our country today. Mm -hmm. So the ability to forgive and to extend grace is something that I think as a Christian has sort of helped mm. me make it through some difficult times when I am Talk about election deniers, race deniers, <laughs> you yep. know, denying that racism is a problem or an issue in our country today is something that I was asked to do as a black conservative, and I just won't. What is your advice to our graduate students who are going into this world of politics, whether they happen to be students of color or not? to continue the conciliation. Mm. You know, Charles and I just celebrated 51 years of marriage. <laughs> and on any given day, we can find 10 different things that we disagree about. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have such a hearty <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so, as you walk through this world, through life, you come into contact with people that you disagree with, mm. that you have a different point of view, mm. that you have a different opinion. Mm. And I think that one of the things that has helped me the most is being a, a follower of Christ, I've been given the tools in order to navigate that. Well. Patience, Fruits forgiveness fruits of the spirit love well and so those things equip you well i've had i've had racist as close friends mm. and dearly love them mm. um i have had women who worked in abortion clinics as friends mm. And I think when we model what Christ loves looks like in those situations, I mean, I could go on with that. Yeah. Um, I think that we are uniquely <laughs> equipped 
to demonstrate to the world what it looks like to live in a pluralistic society. Mm. And we have been equipped to do it. Mm. Man, that's so good. Uh, first question, and I will not give everybody's name, but this first one I must say comes from our own Dr. Skinner. Now, wait a minute. Which has been mysteriously <laughs> placed at the top of the deck. <laughs> I'm sure she had nothing to do with this. Tell and us no, a... I'm not sharing my pound cake <laughs> recipe with you. <laughs> Tell us about your Senate confirmation hearing where a senator prayed while they questioned you. Oh, Anybody remember Senator Bill Armstrong? Oh, yeah, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. Um, I was going through a confirmation hearing, mm. and I was, I, I was surprised that as I went through the hearing, I was expecting him to jump in and ask a softball question <laughs> or, or you know, defend me in some way. And he sat there the entire time, and he just looked. And it was about halfway through the hearing when I realized Oh my word, he's praying. Mm. He is praying. Mm. And the sense of calm that came over me at that point, because Senate confirmation hearings are not easy. Mm. They are very, very difficult to go through. Mm. And, uh, and the effect that that had in that moment, mm. uh, I will, I will, I, he and I became very close friends. and. I uh, admired and respected him a great deal, but to have a United States Senator praying for you when you're going through a confirmation hearing is really special. Uh, I also should acknowledge and give thanks to Joe Biden mm. because he made every one of my children Republicans. <laughs> How was that? Because uh, he was the Senate chair of <clears throat> one of my Republican. confirmation hearings, and he treated me so badly that they decided they never wanted anything to do with anybody that was a son. Yeah. So I'm grateful to him for that. They look at him today and said, you did what to my mama? <laughs> well, he did that to many in those years, I tell you. Um, question more on the political side. Uh-oh. Um, what is your advice, what advice are you giving to Republicans running for office on the abortion issue? Ah. Even if it has little to do with the position they're seeking, they know it will be raised in a campaign. Obviously, yeah. so much has changed since yeah. the Dobbs decision. Um, you, well. In some ways, this was the realization of so much of the work that you had done on the early stages of your career, and now... Yes and no. Mm. Um, so I think that we are where we are on that issue in our country today because we got lazy. Mm. The tough work is in the education piece. When I looked at a high school, my grandson's high school, when the Dobbs decision came down and all of them marched out of school, it occurred to me that probably 95% of the young people who were out there really didn't know or understand or appreciate the issue other than it's a woman's right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we stopped educating on the issue and made it a purely political issue. Mm. And I believe that at this point where we should be as a movement, and we don't even, it, it, it's, a, it's an issue that belongs, I think, in the culture, and, and it, it's an issue that we should be taking on in the cultural and not the political arena at this point. Mm. We failed to educate an entire generation about why this matters. All the focus was on Roe. All the focus was on the politics of it right. and overturning Roe. And we don't know what we're overturning or why. Mm. There's an entire generation out there that, don't, that doesn't understand that this is a civil rights issue that there's a member of the human family that's being discriminated against because of size, age, and place of residence. Mm. 
There's an entire generation out there that doesn't understand. They're debating who's right, and they're not debating whether, whether we as a nation think that the way that we solve our problems is to reach inside mother's wombs and kill babies. Hmm. We, we, we haven't explained it. We haven't won the argument. And if you can't win the argument, you will never win the political side. Hmm. And so I think at this stage, it needs to come out of the political arena and go back into the education and the cultural arena. And we need to do a better job of explaining why. Hmm. And we haven't done that. We have time for a couple more questions. And this, what you've just said actually segues, I think, nicely into this question. It feels like in politics today, people tell you to, quote, play the game of the intense polarization in order to succeed because people don't like those who reach out to other people on the other side. So how do you balance wanting to be in a position to, um, to love others but not wanting to play that game? You mentioned that kind of reaching out to persuade. Mm -hmm. as a, right, OK. Um, first of all, if you go into politics, I think we have too many activists in politics today. Mm. Uh, politics is the art of persuasion. Politics is the uh, art of getting to 50 plus 1. It is politics is consensus building. Um, and and what we have now are people who, if they don't get what they want, want to burn the house down, mm -hmm. as opposed to people who want to come together and solve problems. And um, I, I am in the category of people who believes that you get the best deal you can and go to live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am not going to throw a tantrum if I don't get my way. Mm. What I am going to do is to spend the rest of the time I have with you trying to convince you and pull you over and win you over. Mm. We don't try to win anybody over anymore. We just yell at them. Mm. And, and a politics is the art of persuasion. And if you can't persuade 50 plus one of the people of America to go with you, you lose. Mm. You lose. And you should. Mm. All right, last question, and I'm just going to stream together a few, uh, a few similar ones here. Um, it's kind of captured, uh, captured in this one question. As an African-American conservative, um, and you discussed that you received backlash about that in certain sec sectors, and as a Christian, what is the driving force that keeps you going and standing firm in who you are? Knowing the God that I serve is the driving force mm. that keeps me going. Um, is there a point in which you say, in say whether it's the racial conciliation work, which I think should now mm -hmm. be a term of art, or on behalf of women, that you just say, just enough is enough. You probably heard me say this in one of those, I can't believe you listened to that many speeches, but <laughs> I said, I, I get up every morning and I suit up and I go back to work because I want to leave my grandchildren an America that's at least as free as the one I inherited. Mm. When you look back at my 75 years on the planet, where we were as a country 75 years ago and where we are today, a lot of what happened happened in warp speed, and it happened on my watch. Yeah. This happened on my watch. And when you love your family, and when you love your children and your grandchildren, and you want to leave a world for them that's at least as good as the one you inherited. Mm. I think that's the thing that motivates me every day. Um, I have five of the most incredible grandchildren ever. 
And I know every grandmother would say that, but mine really are. <laughs> um, and I think about what I'm leaving them. Hmm. And I'm thinking about the fact that they are beginning to have to fight some of the same battles that I fought. Hmm. Um, and that's what motivates me. That's what motivates me to get up and go. Hmm. And I think the final thing I would add to that is, um, you know, I think God calls us to be salt and light. Hmm. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't call us to take all of what we have and hide it under a bushel. Hmm. So I think with all that he has given and all that he's given me personally, um, there is a calling to be available to him to continue to work in the vineyard every single day. You know, that perfectly ties in really on the crest of, of Pepperdine. It's the quote from Matthew, when freely you receive, freely mm. give. And that is just a perfect note to end on. Please join me in thanking oh. Kay Coles Thank you. You are the best. Oh. Okay, I'm so grateful for you, and um, I know not only this audience here, but um, our YouTube audience are going to be really blessed by your example and um, and just what you said today. Um, just sometimes it can be dispiriting, and what we're hearing in the public square today is that we need to keep faith and politics out here. And it seems like in some ways faith in politics is already out here. Mm. We need to find ways that our Christian faith can guide us because we believe in calling and we believe a calling Absolutely. to public service and staying true to that and that identity and your encouragement on that. Well, I just want to say that I was encouraged by being here and being on campus, um, knowing that there are troops coming behind me, <laughs> knowing that uh, meeting the students and recognizing their desire to go into government and public policy is such an encouragement, mm. such an encouragement. And I also want to thank the donors who are mm. here. Mm. Um, your return on investment for this country um, is, is just phenomenal. Um, and thank you uh, for, for keeping uh, Pepperdine uh, uh, in your thoughts and your prayers and in your checkbooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think we, we've got uh, some refreshments outside. Um, again, thanks so much for, for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you at our next event. Again, thank you.